Blessed, blessed be our God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals, so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouth because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted Yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who, in every respect, has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And striking him on the face, Pilate went out again and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is your man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for no case, I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate asked him, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew was called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, 
Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and his, the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the, the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, thought a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let them take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, the tomb was nearby, and they laid Jesus there. In the name of the one God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Where is the good in Good Friday? Did you ever stop to think about that? I mean, this really is a dark day of remembrance. Good Friday, in some cultures, is also called Holy Friday, Sorrowful Friday, and God's Friday. You see, as we know, it was on Good Friday that our Lord was crucified. 
And quite frankly, even though there is a day like Good Friday set aside to remember, we don't really like to talk about the deaths and the details of Good Friday. We Protestants don't have the tradition of hanging the crucifix front and center in our churches because a crucifix is a symbol of death and dying on the cross. And to be honest, I've never been one who really wanted to have a crucifix around, but I have begun to rethink this. So the question is, is it just easier to be a fair weather Christian? For example, people who know me well know that I'm not a huge sports fan. I'm not against sports. I even understand the rules of games that are played in this country, but I'm just not a diehard fan. However, when the Chiefs go to the Super Bowl or the Royals to the World Series or KU does well in March Madness, I'm suddenly paying more attention to sports. So yes, I confess, I am a fair weather fan. <laughs> a few years ago, the saying which was passed around as kind of a badge of honor, we serve the risen Christ. And that sounds good, but it was also meant to be a jab, if you will, at the churches that venerated the crucifix. The symbol of Christ hanging crucified on the cross. You see, if we really get honest with ourselves, who wants to be reminded of pain? Who wants to be reminded of agony? We are comfortable with being fair weather Christians. When I went to Springfield last year with our diocese on the lynching pilgrimage, there was someone who brought up that point. They said, but isn't this just drudging up old pain and bad feelings? And the answer to that is yes. But if we don't remember and acknowledge and honor those who have gone before us and the manner in which they suffered and died for us, then we are prone to forget. And I kind of think that is what has happened within some of our faith communities. We are so busy focusing on the risen Christ until we tend to forget the agony of the cross. I mean, painful stories throughout history are hard to hear. But hearing about the agony and the truth of the physical pain brings us right back, full circle, to the sole reason of why we are here in a church on a Friday night talking about a lynching which occurred over 2,000 years ago. If we do not revisit the pain of Good Friday, then we lose the foundational reasons for the celebration of Easter morning. Yet here in our own day, we witness Good Friday every day. Nadia Boltz Weber says, describes a scene in her book, Accidental Saints, in which her church had a practice of going to the scene of a local murder on Good Friday and having a short time of prayer and worship to acknowledge what they knew to be true. Good Friday happens every day. She said, we bring the holy things of the church onto the holy streets of the city because on some level, the violence and despair of Good Friday is a constant human reality. Good Friday happens every day. As we continue to revisit the reading of the Passion from the Gospel of John, as we just did, as we do every year, but you need to know that this reading is very problematic to me because of the way some of the words of this Gospel have been misappropriated by people whose sole purpose is to further actions of hate. And according to, Rev, to Reverend Robert Hill in his book, Beauty and Antisemitism, when this gospel was written, John's community was in the midst of being expelled from the synagogue due to their Christian beliefs. And the words in this gospel come across very harsh against Jews. So, we continue to witness Good Friday. We witness Good Friday as we silently are aware of those who use the words from this gospel as a reason to further cultivate and perpetuate acts of antisemitism. Present-day hate groups 
who continue to use the words in this gospel to further their own hate. Good Friday happens every day. And here at St. Andrews, we also witness Good Friday as we read the names of those who have been murdered the previous week in the Kansas City metro area in our prayers of the people on Sunday mornings. We are reminded, as Nadia Boltz Weber reminds us, Good Friday happens every day. In a short while, this service will end in darkness and we are reliving the darkness of that day. And if you cannot imagine how it would have felt to be in the crowd witnessing such a horrendous execution by the state, then put yourself in the shoes of Mary, the mother of Jesus, or of Mary Magdalene, Jesus' friend and disciple, because they stayed at the foot of the cross. They remained with Jesus until his last breath when all the others who had been close to him ran away. And at the end of this service, there will be a cross here. You are welcome to come and venerate the cross as you witnessed the clergy venerating the cross earlier. And as you'll witness the clergy venerating the cross once it, once it is here. But as I said, this is not something we are accustomed to doing in the Protestant church. This is outside of our comfort zone. But you are so welcome at the end of this service to take a few moments at the foot of the cross, to even use your imagination and stand with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his friend Mary of Magdala. Some of us know firsthand what the pangs of grief feel like, what it means to watch a friend or loved one slip away from this life. So you are welcome, if only for a moment, to stand close to the cross, to touch the cross, to unashamedly bow before the cross. Once the service ends, once the service ends in the darkness, you are welcome to venerate and remember. Yes, we do serve the risen cross, the risen Christ, but do not forget Jesus could not have risen if he had not first been crucified by the state on that wooden cross. We serve the risen Christ, but we remember the pain of the cross. We serve the risen Christ, but we must experience the agony of his mother and friends on that fateful Friday. So, what is the good in Good Friday? The good is our knowing how the story ends. So come back, stay tuned. Easter is right around the corner. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from power of sin and death and become heirs with him in, of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity and witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and people whom they serve, for Diane, our bishop provisional, and for all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for all those about to be baptized, that God will confirm the church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it be in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you 
through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and people of the earth and for those in authority among them, for Joe, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that, they, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and may live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and those with disabilities, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and the bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of God's love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which have grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Behold the wood of the cross, whereon was hung the world's salvation. O come, let us worship. Behold the wood of the cross, whereon was hung the world's salvation. O come, let us worship. Behold the cross displayed, whereon was hung the world's salvation. O come, let us adore him. Behold the wood of the cross, whereon was hung the world's salvation. O come, let us worship. Behold the cross displayed, whereon was hung the world's salvation. O come, let us adore him. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? Or how have I wearied you? Testify against me. I brought you forth from the land of Egypt, and you have brought your Savior to the cross. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal one, have mercy on us. I led you through the desert for 40 years and fed you with manna, and brought you into a land exceeding good, and you have led your Savior to a cross. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal one, have mercy on us. What more have I not done for you that I should have done? I did indeed plant you, O oh my vineyard, with exceedingly sweet fruit, and you have become very bitter to me. For vinegar mingled with gall, you gave me for thirst, and you have pierced with a spear the side of your Savior. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal one, have mercy on us. I scourged Egypt with her firstborn for your sake, and you have scourged me and delivered me up. I led you out of Egypt, drowning Pharaoh in the Red Sea and you have led me to the chief priests. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? Or how have I wearied you to testify against me? I opened the sea before you, and you have opened my side with a spear. I led you in a pillar of cloud, and you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? Or how have I wearied you? Testify against me. I gave you manna in the desert, and you have given me blows and scourges. I gave you the water of life from the rock, and you gave me nothing but gall and vinegar to drink. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? Testify against me. I put a royal scepter in your hands, and you put a crown of thorns on my head. I raised you on high with great power, and you have raised me upon the gibbet of the cross. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? Or how have I wearied you? Testify against me. Be crucified. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.